about uh, to see Peter and to hear Peter uh, this evening talk about the wonderful special exhibition that we have here from Junk to Jewels, the things that Veronica's value. Uh, many of you know Peter. Uh, many of you know Peter, and I see some friends uh, in the crowd, and also his father is here to join us. So thank you very much for coming, Mr. Lee. Uh, Peter has an extensive background, as you know, in the arts. He is a consultant on many projects, most recently on the Baba House. Uh, Peter has worked with the Peronica Museum, of course, for the special exhibition that we have. If you have not had a chance to see it, uh, do go upstairs to the special gallery because um, it's very interesting to see this type of uh, show which involves the community, which Peter grew up with and who knows so many people here, and to see sort of behind the scenes all these wonderful artifacts on display. So without further ado, I know you came here to hear Peter uh, talk about the special exhibition. Please welcome Peter Lee to the Pranica Museum. Hello. Um, good, hi, good, good evening, everybody. Um, Baba Zenonias and friends. Um, I firstly I'd like to thank the Pranakan Museum and Kenson Kwok and Hui Tan Hui Sin for giving me this um, challenge, this huge challenge and this opportunity to, uh, to put this uh, small exhibition together. Um, it was um, a project that was confirmed only well, in early January, so it was quite um, exciting and at the same time so fraught with anxiety. Um, the brief was to pr to create a show, a community show, um, that that gave uh, the you know the voice of um, the voices of the you know Panakan community. Um, and the challenge for me was how to, how to present the same kind of material in a different way. Um, that was really quite a big challenge because um, you know. The material is all the same as what you see in the permanent collection, so I found that that was quite one of the main challenges. Um, the other was to sort of incorporate some of my own um, personal concerns and interests in Pranakan material culture. Um, firstly, in t I, I'm, one of my main focuses is on the things that Pranakans, you know, the difference, what, what we should really define as some what is Pranakan, you know, or, or what is the reason behind calling something Pranakan? And I think it's something that we don't really have an answer to. I think the Pranakan Museum presents a certain point of view, um, but I think it's still open and um, it's an interesting process to refine what this idea is. Um, I see that, firstly, there are things that the Pranakans created, there are things that they commissioned, there are also things they acquired. Then we have the collectors and curators who have acquired and catalogued things and call them Pranakan. We also have things that Pranakans themselves consider Pranakan. So I think there's so many perspectives on, 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 on this whole subject. Um, and I'm, you know, personally I prefer the approach to um, call the objects things that, you know, Created or whatever for the Pranakan market rather than call it a Pranakan object. Um, you know, um, there is a big danger in, 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 in all the material we see to, to say, oh, this is Pranakan. I mean, um, just because they were used by Pranakans. I mean, I, you know, in a hundred years' time, would a, you know, a Mercedes Benz used in a Chinese wedding be called a, you know, Pranakan object as well? So, um, you know, I think these are really important questions and we shouldn't rush to sort of ascribe a Pranakan sort of label to every object we see or that may be associated or were used by the Pranakans. So I thought to, to show this by juxt juxtaposing um, all these issues and throw them all together and let uh, everyone come to their own conclusions. Um, one of the main things I wanted to, to present were the voices of the Pranakan. So every object has a story, and every story is as important as the other. So 
And this, this idea of the story sort of democratizes all the objects. So it doesn't matter whether they're valuable or if they're very ordinary or they're made here or whatever. It's, it's the story and why they were kept that's important. Um, I wanted to also combine objects that were luxurious and also very simple and to throw in things that were local and global. Um, the experience of doing the exhibition was really, really quite uh, amazing for me, um, considering the time frame. Um, well, firstly, because of, of the deadlines, I, I apologize that um, a lot of the objects of the lenders, I mean, there's a sort of nepotistic angle to it. I mean, the community is small, but a lot of them are relatives or friends or immediate contacts that I had. Um, I regretted this almost daily for the last four months. Like, why, why did I do this? I mean, it's so stressful to coordinate 30 lenders and um, 30 stories and, you know, so many stories. But um, anyway, it was a challenge and when everything was up, I think the great joy in seeing um, everybody read the captions and sort of connect to the objects in their own ways and, and form their own conclusions, I think, which is what I wanted. Um, also, there were a lot of objects that could not be shown or were sort of withdrawn at the last minute, and um, that was also an interesting process. Um, so many unresolved family issues, um, things that, um, you know, certain members couldn't reveal that they had. And um, sadly, I mean, some of the most wonderful objects I could not get in the end. Um, I couldn't even sneak a, a photograph to show you today. Um, I was also invited to so many homes. Uh, we just sat down on the floor with relatives and everybody would start speaking at once and I would try and record as much as I could. And it was amazing to be invited to 30 families. Um, and that was really the wonderful experience. And um, it was 30 movies played out all at once and um, trying to make it all make sense. Um, I won't be able to show you everything here today, but I, I was really not um, trying to repeat what you would see. So I'm, I'm trying to show you what I could not include. And, and of course I can't show you every object. Um, there, are, there are wonderful things from the Lee Kim Wee family, the Go Keng Sui family, um, Alvin Yap's family and Shirley, uh, Shirley, uh, Shirley Yap as well. So from very simple objects to uh, objects from families of Singapore and Malaysian statesmen. Um, so what I have is just a selection, just and uh, fresh photographs to sort of excite your uh, interest. Um, I start with this photograph. This is um, possibly one of the earliest photograph of a Pranakan interior or of Pranakans, taken in the early 1860s by a ph photographer called August Sattler. Um, I, I'm starting with this picture because um, really when we look at what Pranakans had or what we considered Pranakan, and if you look at this, it's quite interesting. This is the early 1860s. Um, Tan Kim Seng was still alive, I think he died in 1868. Um, I'm not sure which family this is, but this is the ancestral hall of a Pranakan house. Um, you see that the man on the on the right is seated on a colonial chair. The furniture tends to be quite state colonial, actually. Um, the back, you see the standard Chinese ancestral altar. On the table behind the little girl in the center, there's a sort of what looks like a Canton export vase. Um, nothing, nothing you would say that is out of you know the the altar tables behind a typical. Of, Hokkien altar tables of that period. Um, you see, interestingly, um, a typical sort of lamp of that period. And behind that, there's also this funny thing right at the top. It's sort of this brass lamp that you don't see anymore. Um, but basically, um, I think what we understand is Pranakan, I think, evolved in, throughout the time and in, in, in the 1850s, I think people just had things that they um, that you could get from 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 that was loaded off the ships. So um, a lot of Chinese ex export 